of the Elections Committee to order. Welcome to uh, a new room, and uh, I'm sure it'll be very uh, it'll be very accommodating of our AV needs. So thank you for making the trek over to the Capitol today. Um, a quorum is present. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Um, I know they were hand there was a change, and a new one got handed out. as everyone received them? Just want to make sure first. Okay, um, so with, uh, so the minutes have been handed out. Uh, Representative Coulter, would you like to move approval of the minutes of the February 1st meeting of the Elections Committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So moved. Okay, so moved. Any discussion to the minutes? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are adopted. Uh, the only bill on the agenda today is House File 3. Um, Representative Greenman, would you like to move that House File 3 be recommended to be re-referred to the Transportation, Finance, and Policy Committee? So moved, Madam, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Representative Greenman has moved House File 3. Um, and then the DE3 amendment, as I understand, is to put it in the shape you would like. Would you like to move the amendment? Uh, I would, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the DE. Okay, put so, it in the shape I'd like to hear it. Yep, uh, the DE3 amendment has been moved. That's been um, available online for a few days at least. Um, is there any discussion to the amendment? Uh, Representative Coulter? Sorry, to clarify, Mr. Chair, I have a DE1 amendment. I don't have a DE3. just want to make sure we're all working on the same version of the bill. Excellent. Thank you for the clarification. That is an hour. It is a DE. And my apologies. Uh, it, it is, in fact, the DE1. I was, it was uh, mistyped on the document I'm looking at. Um, so uh, Representative Greenman withdraws the motion to move the DE3 <laughs> amendment that doesn't exist and moves to adopt the DE1 amendment, which does. Uh, is there any discussion to the DE1 amendment? OK. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. The, the amendment's been adopted. There's also an A5 amendment. Um, because of a miscommunication, it did not. It was not submitted to the CA uh, in time to meet deadline. If you see the timestamp on it, it was in fact produced before. Then um, I'm just looking to Representative Torkelson. Um, you know, this is an. I can have. Uh, actually, how about you explain it first, Representative Greenman, and then I'll turn to Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the A5 amendment is an amendment that uh, we would like to adopt that um, Senator Coran offered in uh, in the Senate hearing of Senate File 3, um, and uh, it is it would allow transparency when it comes to the absentee ballot applications. Uh, 48 other states do it, and so um, if uh, um, there was a miscommunication that didn't get it there before 8.30 uh, this morning, or yesterday morning, I think it was like, 9.30 when it was posted, but uh, we'd like to add it if you are, if the, the minority party is so willing, um, and that's the amendment. Yeah, and we can either add it here, um, or it would be your intention to add it, I understand, at a later committee stop. Uh, Representative Torkelson, did you have any thoughts on that? Or? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I certainly have no objection to this amendment. Uh, sorry about the delay in response uh, in the background here. Uh, I suffered a bad knee over the weekend, and slowed me down a bit, but, uh, and I really just do not name, name those other, that other body by name in this <laughs> committee, uh, even though I, you know, I like some of them, I don't like, you know, we shouldn't really talk about them so much. Uh, we, this is our work uh, in our committee, and uh, I believe uh, that uh, we are fine with this amendment, and would, if you want to adopt it in this committee, where I think it's appropriate to be adopted, uh, I would be glad to move the A5 amendment. Oh. Thank you. Appreciate that. Representative Torkelson has moved the A5 amendment. Um, any discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries. Thank you, uh, Representative Torkelson. So the bill is in the shape you would like. Uh, Representative Greenman, would you like to describe the bill? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, House File uh, 3, uh, the Democracy for the People Act, is a comprehensive democracy bill that invests, protects, and strengthens Minnesota's best traditions of the voter participation, elections administration, transparency in government, and grassroots people-powered democracy. This package uh, of common sense solutions rests on the simple premise that our state works best when Minnesotans' voices are at the center of our democracy. All Minnesotans, black, brown, indigenous, white, metro and greater Minnesota, rich, poor, Democrat, Republican, independents, and folks with no party at all, 
Minnesota voters, not corporations, not, for, not uh, national forces, are at the center of our democracy. This bill responds to the urgent and the overdue with reforms to empower voters and strengthen our election systems. In the last few years, we've seen our democracy tested in unimaginable ways. A global pandemic, a violent insurrection at the nation's capital, the rising climate of fear, rhetoric, and disinformation. The last election also highlighted problems that Minnesota vote voters have been asking us to tackle for years. More money in our elections dominated by big donors, big corporations, and outside spending. Since Citizens United over a decade ago, there's been an explosion of spending by outside groups, independent expenditures that are not accountable to voters or candidates, and in many cases, voters and candidates may not know who's funding them at all. Here in Minnesota, our disclosure laws haven't kept pace. In fact, Follow the Money gave Minnesota an F for disclosure of, unside, of outside spending. And year after year, we've seen these issues grow. But the fact is that in 2022, in the first year, um, the first election since January 6th, with democracy firmly on the ballot, 2.5 million Minnesotans turned out to both participate in our democracy and to protect it. The promise of American democracy is that we, together, have the power to improve it, to expand it, and to strengthen it. And that's what this bill does. In Article I of this bill, it strengthens the freedom to vote by modernizing and expanding voter registration through automatic voter registration, 16 and 17 year old pre-registration, and um, so that they can be on the, vol the, the rolls when they turn 18. And it enables every voter who wants to to sign up for the permanent early voting list. Article II protects voters in our election system by ensuring voters have access to materials in the language that they need it and ensuring that our polling places with, uh, um, with uh, lots of folks who may not speak English very well have access to that translation that they need. It includes a strong provision to protect voters and volunteers from intimidation and harassment that could interfere with their freedom to vote. And it gives law enforcement the tools they need to fight deceptive practices and acts of disinformation intended to interfere with the vote. Article three contains transparency and disclosure provisions to ensure that Minnesotans know who's spending money uh, to influence their vote. It closes the dark money loopholes uh, with the express advocacy provision and requires disclosure of, speaker, of secret spending so that voters know who's spending money on ads and materials to influence their vote in our elections. And it extends uh, the foreign to foreign influence corporations the existing prohibition on foreign nationals contributing in our elections. As a voting rights lawyer who's worked on democracy policy all over the country, I can tell you that these are good reforms that strengthen the access and security to our elections. And that's why they've been passed in red states and blue states and purple states. But this isn't about the party of the elected officials passing the bill. It's about how it infects voters. And this bill protects and strengthens access to Minnesota voters, Republicans, Democrats, independents, and folks with no party at all. In the last three years, we've seen our democracy tested in unimaginable ways, and there are challenges ahead. But in Minnesota, we've come together to tackle big challenges before, and I can't think of a more important opportunity and effort now than working on these common sense uh, reforms that protect and strengthen our democracy and Minnesota voters and communities uh, put them at the center. With that, Mr. Chair, I believe we have some testifiers. I know we also have some amendments. I'm not sure when, when you want to dispose of that. Uh, thank you. I think I'll take testimony first. Um, so we do have several people who've signed up. Um, we will be, uh, I want to make sure there's time for amendments and member discussion, so uh, there will be uh, time limits in place. The first, uh, Secretary Simon will be up first, um, followed by uh, Director Sigurdsson of the Campaign Finance Board. Um, we've allocated five minutes for each of them um, because this affects their agencies um, pretty directly. Um, and then public, and then the following testifiers will be uh, allocated two minutes each. So welcome to the committee. Uh, Secretary Simon, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Member Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. I'm honored to be here to talk about House File 3. It has several important provisions in it that I think will strengthen Minnesota's voting systems and increase access for voters. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, some of them don't pertain directly to our office, and some of them have already been discussed in this hearing, so I'm going to really focus on three. Automatic voter registration, increased language access, and increased protection for voters. 
On automatic voter registration, let me just say from the outset, and I've had some of these one-on-one -on -one discussions with you in your various offices, I think that phrase, automatic voter registration, is itself a little bit of a misnomer. I wish that reform, this reform, were to go by another name. Uh, because voter registration in this instance is not automatic. Nothing about it is automatic. Real human beings will still filter and screen. More specifically, our 87 county partners will still review and process registrations. They'll still go through the same state and federally required checks. And this is a key point to automatic voter registration. So it's not so much different from a lot of what we have in current law right now. But it does expand the pool of registrations. Uh, and all the safeguards to our current processes remain. I think one thing to note here uh, is that it would probably reduce same-day voter registrations by 80 to 90 percent. Now, I love same-day voter registration. It is the cornerstone. It is the jewel in the crown of Minnesota election law, in my view, in my judgment. But I understand, just as a matter of reality, that there are some people in this room that have misgivings about it. If you do, this is the bill for you because it would probably cut 80 to 90 percent of same-day voter registrations. And whether you have misgivings or not, same-day voter registrations um, are somewhat of a hiccup in the polling place. Uh, we rely on 30,000 people every election cycle to stand up and step up and be election judges. And anyone in this room or otherwise who's been an election judge can tell you that that process of registering people in the polling place, while an important cornerstone of the system, there's no question. It's a complex process. It's the most complex process that election judges have to administer. So among the many other advantages that you've heard about and that you will hear about on this bill, that is one, I think, that's worth noting that I think is, is somewhat fresh in terms of this debate. I next want to talk briefly about the increased language access. This is a key part of this bill and one that uh, I think is, is particularly worthy of, of attention and support. Our office already, by choice, it's not in statute, we just have chosen to provide elections-related material in 11 different languages. It used to be five. We've more than doubled it to 11. Uh, that's a choice. Like I said, no law uh, tells us that we have to do it. This bill, I think, would go down the road in polling places of requiring that there be languages uh, in, in, in that, that really communicate to people in the way that they speak. And let me zoom out for a minute and say this. I, once in a while, I'll get pushback on that general issue. And I understand it. I don't question it. And I think it's reasonable for people to ask, as they sometimes do. They'll say, hey, why do we need languages? Uh, why do we need election materials in any language other than English? After all, you can only vote if you're a citizen. And you can only become a citizen in almost all instances if you pass, pass an English proficiency test. So people will ask, and it's not unreasonable, why should we have any election materials in languages other than English if, by definition, the person standing there voting has, uh, has demonstrated proficiency in English? Two responses to that. One is somewhat personal. I'm the son of an immigrant. I grew up in a bilingual household. And I know how this works in the real world, not in a book, not in theory, but in practice. My mother was fluent in English. That wasn't the issue. But when it came to technical instructions, I don't care whether it was the refrigerator manual or a government document, she wanted that stuff in her native language, as any of us would. I think that's how we're wired. So it's not a question of lack of proficiency. It's if you want to communicate a rule to somebody, do you want them to understand it or not? That's, that's the blunt question. Do you or don't you? If you do, you're going to communicate it in a way that they're going to understand. And in the case of my mother and many, many other people, all of us, I would say. Our native language is how we're wired. Number two is history. We have been doing this in Minnesota. We have been providing elections-related materials in other languages since 1896. Not 1996, 1896. And it's my failing. I failed to bring to you uh, today. I have literally my office under plastic, yellowed copies from the Historical Society, starting in 1896 when we printed election-related materials in Swedish, Finnish, Norwegian, French, German, and on and on and on. The only difference between what this bill will effectuate in law uh, and what we've been doing for over 120 years is the languages. We don't print anything in Swedish and Norwegian anymore. It won't shock you to know. The languages are different, but that's it. In principle, there is zero difference between what this bill tries to effectuate and what we have been doing for over oh, pretty much a, a century and a quarter. Uh, last point is on increased protection for voters. Uh, this is a great part of this bill. We've seen increased issues of intimidation and attempted Im Im intimidation in Minnesota and across the country. And while I'm heartened that we haven't had the same issues in Minnesota as other states in the country, uh, we're not immune to these issues. In 2020, you remember that uh, we had to go to court to prevent an effort to bring armed guards to polling places, like armed citizens to polling places. 
uh, against the wishes of our county and city election officials. So this bill is going to go a long, long way to protecting the right of every Minnesotan, regardless of zip code, regardless of life experience, from making sure that uh, they have an unhindered right to vote in Minnesota. So those are the three positions or, or, or portions of the bill I just wanted to talk to. Thanks for your time and attention, members. I appreciate it. Thank you, Secretary Simon. Uh, next is uh, Director Jeff Sigurdsson of the Campaign Finance Board. Um, after Director Sigurdsson, we will have a virtual testifier, um, Arlene Datu. Um, welcome to the committee, Sorry. Director Sigurdsson. Uh, oh, yeah, I understand there's a PowerPoint here, too. Welcome to the committee. Um, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members. My name is Jeff Sigurdsson, Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board. Um, the board doesn't have an overall position on House File 3, but has made a legislative recommendation dealing with the functional equivalent standard uh, for express advocacy. And I just wish to provide some, some quick examples to the committee uh, so I can perhaps better understand what we're talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you could talk into the microphone, sure. too. Um, as you may have seen in the Star Tribune, there was about $63 million in independent expenditures uh, made in the 2022 election. And you can see in the graph how that's uh, grown over the years, a rather explosive growth uh, compared to prior elections. The board's concern is that that may not, in fact, be all of the independent expenditures that are occurring in Minnesota. Um, we don't believe through our uh, through complaints that the board has looked at, that all are being reported to the state. Uh, this may lead to other independent expenditure committees and funds to disclose or opt out of disclosure of independent expenditures. And frankly, the, it creates an inconsistency between federal and state campaigns. I do have a few examples to look at, and I wanna make sure that you understand that this is from 2014 and frankly, I have examples that will probably uh, irritate both sides of the aisle because they're rather partisan in nature. But this particular advertisement ran uh, 885 times in 2014 at a cost over a million dollars, but was never reported because it has no express advocacy in it. Governor Dayton and the Democrats completely control our state government. And look at what they're doing. They're building a new luxury office building for themselves. A building that will cost taxpayers $77 million. And to pay for their new luxury office building, they passed a record-setting tax increase. And our property taxes went up. Instead of wasting our tax dollars on their new luxury office building, why are Governor Dayton and the Democrats fixing our roads and potholes? Minnesota, we deserve better. Now again, no one said vote for, no one said vote against, no one said re-elect or defeat. Because of that, that doesn't meet the express advocacy standard that Minnesota currently used to identify independent expenditures. Instead, they used verbiage that would lead them outside of that definition, and there was therefore no need for that organization to register with the board or report the sources of funding that it used for those independent expenditures, which after all is the whole point of disclosure, is so that the Minnesota public understands where the money is coming from and what organizations are trying to influence elections. This was also from 2014. Oops. There we go. Look across the land on farms and in factories, in classrooms and construction sites. Minnesota is working. For Sorry, just trying to make full screen. Look across the land on farms and in factories, in classrooms and construction sites. Minnesota is working. Four years ago, Minnesota faced a $5 billion deficit. But Governor Mark Dayton showed strong leadership. He raised taxes on the wealthiest 2% so we could invest in our schools and reduce middle class taxes. Now Minnesota has over 150,000 new jobs and a budget surplus. Governor Mark Dayton is working for us. 
Now, I suppose the question is, what's the problem? This was disclosed to the board at $2,395,000. Well, the problem is, is that, again, both of those ads are from 2014. In one case, one of the entities is disclosing everything to Minnesota, but you have to wonder at some point if they're going to realize that, or at least potentially, that the uh, entities which are on the opposite side of the issue aren't registering and disclosing to the board and may lead them to, discuss, to, to determine that, well, by simply voting, uh, avoiding words like vote for and vote against, we have no reason to go through the regulation with the Campaign Finance Board, and that will, again, impact the ability for the board to be able to say how much was spent on independent expenditures. Very quickly, a couple of other examples. This is from a Republican primary against a former representative state, uh, Representative Loon. Um, investigation didn't use words vote for against more recently. Uh, this is another one from Representative Sandstead. Again, there was, after an investigation, there was no uh, express advocacy used. This is the inconsistent standard. Uh, at the federal level, you see the sort of advertisement where you, you know, there's one side, these are all the good reasons to vote for a candidate, the other's the reasons not to, but no one ever uses the words vote for or vote against. And therefore, at the federal level, using the functional equivalent, which has been used by the FEC for years, this is an independent expenditure that has to be disclosed. A very similar advertisement in Minnesota that, again, doesn't use words like vote for or vote against, doesn't have to be disclosed. So we have an inconsistent standard, not only for Minnesota voters, to understand what's going on, but even for the regulated community as to what, what they have to do to comply with the Minnesota statute. And that's my examples, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, hopefully the audio was uh, discernible, at least for the people at home. We'll see how the, <laughs> we'll see how the virtual testimony goes here. Um, I'll keep my fingers crossed, but uh, the first testifier is a virtual one. Um, Arlene Datu, and after Arlene will be Sharon Tornes. If you want to come, go up to the table just to be ready. Um, so, it is the virtual testimony. Okay, uh, Arlene Datu, I think if you could you start speaking so we can confirm that we can hear you. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> um, so to my great relief. So if you could just identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony, you will have two minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. My name is Arlene Dachu. I live in St. Paul, and I'm a member of Isaiah. I spent most of my professional life working at a number of major corporations in Minnesota and Chicago. I left the corporate world in 2007 but I had long ago realized the truth about corporations. That is, they only look out for themselves. As a corporate employee, I was told time and again that we were the most important resource. They told us we are a team and we're in this together, when in reality, we were the first to lose our jobs when profits took a hit. Corporations prioritize their shareholders, who are often the executives and CEOs themselves and only look out for their own investments. It's very clear to me corporate interests are very different from the employees and the community's interests. Yet corporations and other special interests have massive influence on who runs for office and what issues they decide to talk about. I often felt pressure to give to our company's corporate PAC. Oftentimes, I wasn't told where my money would go or what it would end up supporting. It is absolutely essential we change our current system to limit the influence of these corporate actors. In this last biennial election, we saw an influx of grassroots donors who felt empowered to elect leaders who represented them and their communities. But corporations funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars through many different and often dark channels. In order to create a system that works for all of us, we need to expand access to voting and make it possible for people's voices to count through both their vote and financial means. Right now, we are currently at a disadvantage against corporations. We have to close the loopholes in our campaign finance system and restore power to Minnesotans. We need to prohibit foreign influence corporations from spending in our elections, and we need to adopt the federal standards for express advocacy so we can start updating outdated transparency and disclosure laws in our state so that people actually see who is spending in our elections 
and how much they're spending. If you could please think, wrap up your testimony in one or two sentences, that'd be sure, great. Sure, I think House File 3 is a necessary step in the right direction to do all of this. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Thank you, Arlene Datu. Next uh, testifier is in person. It is Sharon Tornes, and after Sharon Tornes will be Paul Huffman. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Freiberg and members. Uh, my name is Sharon Tornes, and I'm on the Policy Committee of Clean Elections Minnesota. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that supports fair elections in Minnesota. I want to thank Representative Greenman for introducing the We the People Act, and while we support all the provisions in HF3, I am here in particular to testify in support of Article 3, the Campaign Finance and Disclosure section. We testified before this committee in support of HF 117 that would ban foreign corporation contributions. The committee passed that bill, which closes a dangerous loophole in our electoral system. HF 117 and SF3 propose plugging that loophole by making it illegal for a company that is at a certain threshold of ownership by foreign owners from spending money directly or giving it to a super PAC to spend in state or local elections. We need limits on political spending by corporations with significant foreign ownership to help protect our dem democratic self-government. Next, we support broadening the standard of expressly advocating. In the 2022 midterms, as we've seen, $63 million in independent expenditures were reported, but many went unreported. Dark money is on the rise, and it is contaminating our political system. Ask your constituents. They're sick of all the election messaging and ads in the media. The media likes it, no surprise there, but your voters don't. This bill, if passed, would expand the number of independent expenditures required to be reported to the state. The state standard is narrow. If you don't use the magic words listed in statute, you don't have to report the expenditures to the Campaign Finance Board. The new definition would close that loophole. If you're trying to influence an election, you have to report it, full stop. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify, and we urge your support for HF3. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next testifier is Paul Huffman, and after Paul Huffman will be an online uh, virtual testifier, Orion Danjuma. Um, welcome to the committee, Paul Huffman. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Freiberg and committee members. I'm Paul Huffman, and I'm testifying today based on my experience as a head election judge over the last three years in four different precincts. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors and the Voter Service Chair for League of Women Voters Minnesota. Um, I'm speaking today in favor of three specific aspects of House File 3, automatic voter registration, pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, and permanent absentee voter status. My experience as a head election judge has given me some perspective on how we can help voters and election workers. This is especially applicable to reducing the number of election day registrations, which my experience has ranged anywhere from 3 to 10 percent of election day voters. While we enjoy doing election day registrations, they can be complex and time consuming for election judges. Uh, using automatic voter registration allows voters to, to register to vote or update existing registrations, very importantly, when they update address and personal information with the state. This reduces the potential for minor administrative errors during manual data entry, which can occur, and challenges election judges. That also affects confidence in the integrity of voter rolls. Automatic voter registration also benefits election judges by reducing the numbers of voters requiring election day registration. Pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds provides an opportunity to engage and educate them in their civic rights and duties before they turn 18. For many young people, their first election when they're eligible to vote occurs when they're away from home for college and military service, such as I had in the United States Navy. This makes it very difficult for them to register to vote if they're not already registered. Uh, finally, many of our election day registrations are new voters, and this would also reduce those election day registrations. Finally, establishing permanent absentee voter status is important for those voters who, due to personal circumstances, choose or need to vote by absentee ballots. This includes long-term military service, such as I had, long-term disabilities, and those unable or reluctant to vote in person at a polling place due to some other condition. Providing this opportunity for eligible registered voters would to be designated as permanent absentee voters supports those voters in participating in the electoral process. I thank you for your time and uh, suggest supporting House File 3. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. 
The next testifier is a virtual testifier, uh, Orion Danjuma. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much and good morning, members. My name is Orion Danjuma and I'm counsel at Protect Democracy, a cross-partisan nonprofit organization. A central focus of my work is combating voter intimidation and political violence nationwide. I'm honored to be with you today. Minnesota has long been a leader in modeling broad-based civic participation in American democracy, and that leadership is necessary now more than ever. I'd like to provide you with a bit of national perspective on the problem of voter intimidation. House File 3 comes at a critical crossroad for our democracy. We've lived through more than two years of sustained threats of political violence following the 2020 election. Last October, the Department of Homeland Security and FBI issued a bulletin stating Stating that perceptions of election related fraud were driving threats of violence and efforts to justify violence leading up to the midterm elections. These threats are far from abstract. Last fall, I represented the League of Women Voters of Arizona in a court case to stop severe voter intimidation. Spurred by disinformation and conspiracy theories, a group of vigilantes executed an operation to surveil mail-in drop box locations in Arizona and other states. Events culminated in an incident where armed vigilantes dressed in tactical gear and wearing balaclava masks appeared to patrol drop box location. One voter described how when he went to deliver his ballot with his wife, he was approached by monitors who said they were hunting people they suspected of voter fraud. No citizen should have to vote under circumstances like this. But unfortunately, this problem is not going away anytime soon. We were able to obtain an injunction barring the members of this organization from engaging in voter intimidation, but those organizers and others like them have pledged to continue uh, operations such as this one in other uh, states across the country. And we've seen other incidents in recent years. In Minnesota itself, in 2020, we saw a mercenary organization, Atlas Aegis, which tried to hire ex-Special Forces agents to patrol the polls. And in Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania, thousands of robocalls have been issued, giving voters disinformation about their eligibility to vote. We that. need... If you could just wrap up your testimony in one or two sentences, that would be great. We need tools at the state level to protect voters and ensure that they can participate in the political process without fear. House File 3 provides a comprehensive framework to protect these voters from intimidation and fills critical gaps in the legal, legal framework. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next testifier is in person. It's Abdi Karim Mahamoud. If you could please come forward um, to the testimony table. Um, while you're doing that, I'll just mention the next testifier will be Scott Drexel, who will be testifying virtually. Uh, welcome to the committee, Abdi Karim Mahamoud. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Um, my name is Abdi Karim Mahamoud, and um, my name is Abdi Karim Mahamoud, and I am one of the leaders of Muslim Coalition of Isaiah, and I live um, Cedar Riverside. Um, I'm also a student at uh, Metro State University, and I have been involved in democracy and fighting for my community in since 2020. Um, since then, it has been an amazing experience being a political active, being aware of the issues that are partic particular uh, within my communities and city and the state. And, and the state. In the last election, I was devastated to hear some eligible Somali elders in my community who first language is not English and struggle to register and to vote because they didn't understand the language. Some of them were told that they couldn't be, they, they some of them told, told them, told that they couldn't be helped and um, even though they were even though they should have the right to interpretation support and at the poll areas after the knocking after knocking a thousand of doors and encouraging and educating thousands of elders on the importance of voting it is discourage for them and makes them not want to vote 
and makes them make, makes them not want to come back to vote again when they poorly dealt with at the polls. But they are U.S. citizens and they care about our democracy and want to participate and they deserve to be here to be to have a voice uh, to even if it is not in English. And if you could wrap up in one or two sentences, that would be great. Awesome. Yeah, so basically um, last uh, election I was working with the electionists and also helping them. Um, by helping them, um, um, I saw like a lot of people that um, who elderly um, that don't speak English and they were struggling um, at the poll area and because they don't know who to vote and they, don't, they, they can't even read the names um, who's on there. And I was trying to help them, but I couldn't help them because, um, because um, they don't allow it. So yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, the next testifier is a virtual testifier, um, Scott Drexel. And after Scott Drexel will be another virtual testifier, Eric Wong. Uh, welcome to the committee, Scott Drexel. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Scott Drexel, and I'm here on behalf of the National Vote at Home Coalition. We are a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that advances policy aimed at increasing voters' access to, use of, and confidence in voting from home, in which voters receive mailed out paper ballots, return them either by postage free mail or in person to a range of accessible, convenient, and secure locations, and can track them online in real time to ensure that their vote is counted. We come before you today to voice our strong support for House File 3, and in particular, the provision of the legislation that allows Minnesotans to register once to receive their ballots in the mail for all future elections. This is the so-called permanent absentee provision, which we refer to as single sign-up. The core benefit to voters is the simplification of process. Voters do not need to reapply for a mailed-out ballot for every election or every year. They get their ballot delivered to them for every subsequent election automatically unless they move or opt out. This provides voters not only with convenience, but also reminds them of the upcoming election and encourages them to participate. Numerous studies have shown that when voters have easy access to mailed out ballots, they vote often at greater levels than their polling place counterparts. This is particularly important in local elections, special elections and primaries, where voter turnout can drop by as much as 50 or even 75% than in a general election. Moreover, the change is good for local election officials. Under Minnesota's current system, Election officials and administrators must process absentee ballot requests for many of the same voters election after election, year after year. In fact, recent research across multiple states revealed that 50, as much as 50% of those voting absentee are repeat applicants. By allowing voters to sign up for permanent absentee status, election officials will see a drastic reduction in paperwork and administrative impact across their organization. On average, counties save as much as $1 per ballot request they don't have to process by implementing single sign-up. We hope Minnesota will join the list of 15 states that have already enacted single sign-up, with more states considering it in this current legislative session, and urge the committee's support. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next testifier is an online testifier, um, Eric Wong. And after Eric Wong is an in-person testifier, Kathy Blazer. Um, Kathy Blazer, you're welcome to come to the testifying table while Eric Wong testifies. Uh, welcome to the committee. Eric Wong, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Eric Wang, and I'm a political attorney who represents and advises clients on the campaign finance laws at the federal level and in all 50 states. I'm appearing today on behalf of People United for Privacy, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit that works to protect donor privacy. I'd like to address what is now Article 3, Section 1 of HF3, which would expand Minnesota's expressly advocating definition. And this definition, by the way, is one that I've grappled with uh, while working at the Federal Election Commission, as well as in my private practice uh, representing clients. So basically, this provision would expand the scope of regulated speech in Minnesota that triggers public reporting of an organization's donors. And that's an important point, because Mr. Sigurdsson's testimony focused on the reporting of expenditures, but he didn't focus on the other side of the reporting requirement, which is reporting an organization's donors. 
Now, the popular narrative is that this provision is all about cracking down on so-called dark money organizations, which are supposedly bad. Uh, but this is really an issue where the stance that people take tends to be situational. Dark money organizations are almost always the ones that you don't support or that don't support you. They, they tend not to be the ones that align with your agenda. The truth is, dark money organizations include well-known groups taking both sides of important policy issues, from pro-choice to pro-life groups, from gun control to gun advocacy groups, from L LGBT rights groups to family values groups. Uh, in a democracy, all of these hot button issues have to be hashed out in the public arena, but there also has to be an element of privacy involved. Organizations that represent different viewpoints on these issues and their donors are entitled to protect their donors' privacy. HF3 would deter all of these organizations from public advocacy directed at elected officials like yourselves. Because if their speech is deemed to be express advocacy for or against an elected official under the broader speech standard that the bill would enact, the Minnesota law requires them to register and report as, so -called, as a so-called political fund and their donors would have to be publicly outed, named, shamed, fired, or even fired upon. And perhaps, so um, thank you so much, and I'm available to answer any questions you might, ha might have. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Eric Wang. Um, and the final testifier who signed up in advance is Kathy Blazer. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify against House File 3. I am Kathy Blazer, co-executive director of Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life. The First Amendment of our Constitution protects both our freedom of speech and our freedom to associate with others. And our courts have consistently ruled that those two rights in conjunction prohibit a state from limiting the fundamental right of a nonprofit advocacy organization to comment on the votes, statements, or actions of public officials. The changed express advocacy definition in section two of this bill would directly violate those rights. Court case after court case has recognized that a group of citizens who freely associate as, associate as a nonprofit corporation like MCCL have an almost unlimited right to comment on the votes, statements, and actions of political officials. To severely limit that right, which section two would do, would gut that protection and so would quickly be found unconstitutional. Supporters of Section 2 will state that it doesn't limit our right to free speech. All we need to do is form a PAC, which the state would allow to say or write the same content. But again, courts have repeatedly and consistently ruled that true express advocacy, as explicitly defined by the Supreme Court, must be done through PACs. But any other communication about the votes, statements, or actions of public officials may not be barred to citizens who associate together as a nonprofit organization. This very point was made clear in the dicta of the 2012 8th Circuit case MCCL v. Swanson, in which we prevailed on free speech grounds against another very restrictive Minnesota law attempting to deprive nonprofit advocacy groups of our rights. MCCL is resolved to continue to defend our rights to free speech and association. Any attempt to redefine express advocacy would be an irresponsible expenditure of public funds, having no chance of ultimately being upheld in court. Case after case has resulted in the same outcome for those attempting to restrict corporate speech we respectfully ask you to reject such unconstitutional and irresponsible action to limit the free speech of Minnesota citizens. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any members of the public who would wish to testify? <coughs> okay, seeing none, I'll uh, turn to amendments. Uh, Representative Bliss, do you have uh, the A4 amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very simple amendment. Um, we just passed off the floor of the House a few days ago, um, or a month ago, I don't know the time, it's kind of a blur right now. Uh, driver's license uh, for all, which uh, allows non-citizens to get driver's licenses. Uh, we've seen in other states that have implemented this type of rule that there's been some snafus and uh, people have been 
registered to vote that, that were not eligible. My amendment simply states that uh, other than non-compliant license or identification cards, so basically real ID and enhanced driver's license, which requires either proof of citizenship or proof of legal uh, residency here in the state. Uh, and I would just uh, appreciate if you'd accept this amendment uh, to ensure that we have clean, fair, and safe elections. Uh, Representative Bliss, I'm presuming you would like to move the oh, A4. I'm sorry, I'd like to move the A4. <laughs> okay, so the A4. Do I have to say all that again? <laughs> uh, I, I think we got the gist. Thank so, you. Yes, uh, Representative Bliss has moved the A4 amendment. Uh, Representative Greenman, do you have any comments um, on it? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and uh, Representative Bliss. Um, and this allows me an opportunity, I, if, if folks are watching the transportation and, and on the floor, um, as people know, um, uh, the driver's licenses uh, um, for all bill we passed does not impact uh, voting at all. A driver's license is not a voter card. It's not a public benefits card. Um, and what's important, and the reason I'd ask you to vote no on this, is there will be, there are lots of citizens who will apply for non-compliant driver's licenses. And if they, uh, if they show proof of citizenship, those folks should be automatically registered too. The way that the automatic voter registration uh, system works is you have to show documentation of citizenship and only those folks will be passed on. So if we include this amendment, what it will mean is if a US citizen comes in, they show a documentary uh, proof of citizenship, but they don't apply, they don't want a real ID or an enhanced ID, they will be excluded from the system. And so uh, I respectfully ask for you um, uh, not to limit those folks' opportunity to be automatically registered and to vote uh, against this amendment. Uh, Representative Kwam, to the amendment. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I, I would have to bring up the fact that with the current system, as audited by the legislative auditor, uh, I guess twice in 2018 because of uh, uh, irregularities in um, what they saw that in the 2016-2018 election cycles, there were uh, tens of thousands of bad registrations verified that they were bad by the HAVA requirement for the Social Security Administration website verification and that if with the current system we're already having tens of thousands of bad registrations and the fact that uh, uh, you know same day registration isn't a single day in Minnesota it's multiple days and so that the uh, votes are cast and commingled before they can be verified and many of our elections are decided by uh, a few votes, and many statewide elections are decided by a few hundred votes, uh, I do not think it's trivial to be concerned about issues and have concerns about the possible uh, problems that could arise and ignore the fact that other states have documented uh, problems that they've incurred in the uh, magnitude that exceeds the margin of victory in uh, you know our statewide races at times. So you know, frankly, I, I wish that we would take seriously the integrity and making sure that our citizens are assured of the integrity by having appropriate uh, measures because, um, you know, and again, these are elections before the controversy of, you know, 2020. And these are things that are documented and we had committee testimony from nonpartisan legislative auditor. So to say, well, there is no problem and this won't um, increase the opportunity for problem is uh, trivializing the facts. Any additional discussion to the amendment? Uh, Representative Bliss? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just request a roll call vote. Okay, a roll call has been requested. Any final discussion to the amendment? Okay, uh, seeing none, a roll call has been requested. The clerk will take the roll on the A4 amendment. Chair Freiberg? No. Vice Chair Greenman? No. Representative Torkelson, or sorry, Minority Leader Torkelson? Aye. 
Representative Agbaje. No. Representative Altendorf. Yes. Representative Bonner. No. Representative Bliss. Yes. Representative Coulter. No. Representative Davis. Yes. Representative Frederick. No. Representative Purcell. No. Representative Quam. C. Uh, Representative Stevenson is excused. Okay, there be five ayes and seven nays. Uh, the amendment is not adopted. Uh, Representative Quam, do you have the A6 amendment? I do, uh, Mr. Chair, and I would move the A6 amendment. Okay, Representative Quam has moved the A6 amendment. Please describe your amendment, Representative Quam. Um, the author of the bill stated modernizing and updating, and frankly, this would just, for years and years, when you're doing stuff online or in person, there's that um, opt-out thing that pops right up. And, you know, most of us are pretty used to seeing, oh, there's an opt-out option, and they can check that. And actually saying we're going to mail out the information to opt out, I, I think that's archaic. So this amendment says at the time a qualifying application is submitted, the individual submitting the application must immediately be provided a notice of the opportunity to decline. And that would bring us into the uh, uh, last century for uh, convenience. So I think it's common sense that we, you know, adopt this amendment and it's an easy process um, and it saves us the effort and cost of, you know, mailing out something that could be, if you do it online, it, it's right there. It's, it's part of the uh, initial uh, development and rollout. If you're doing it in person, my gosh, don't we have a lot of forms that we have in front of people to begin with? This you just in include. So I think it's common sense, and I, I would hope this uh, a committee would support this, and I would ask for a roll call. Yeah. The roll call's been requested. Uh, Representative Greenman, uh, to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and committee members, I'd ask you uh, to, to vote no on this amendment. Um, this would fundamentally change the way that automatic voter registration works. The whole point is that when you're in the hurried and hectic environment of the DMV with DMV employees who are, their job is not voter registrars and anything else, is to move this process out of um, um, that process. And so the way we're, we're gonna get into more about how voter automatic voter registration works, I'm sure, but the whole point is that if you show the, the, the documentation you need to register uh, that's sent to the, the Secretary of State, in, if you, including uh, citizenship documentation, and then the Secretary of State sends that to the counties. And so the information you're getting is full information from the county auditors, which is actually the police. Um, that's the police. Uh, they're the ones charged with registering you to vote. So uh, with that, I'd ask you to vote no on this amendment. Okay. Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Greenman. Um, just to be really crystal clear on this, you know, first I should mention that, you know, when we talk about things like savings, that, that negates how the actual process works. So when someone walks into the Department of Vehicle Services, they're showing sets of identification that show three basic th things, that they are who they say they are, they live where they say they live, and they are an eligible voter. We have individuals in those polling places who review these documents for up to eight hours a day, at minimum five days a week, maybe Saturdays if they're open, who have experience in looking at these types of documentation every day. So again, they are verifying you are who you say you are, you live where you say you live, and you are an eligible voter. In order to be put into the system, you have to have shown some of that information in order to, sh to verify that you are an eligible voter. It then goes through a system of robust checks in databases that check against that information to again verify that you are who you say you are, 
you live where you say you live, and you are an eligible voter. If all of those things happen, and they happen well, what actually happens is that it, then you will get a card in the mail. You get this nifty little card that says, guess what? You're an eligible voter. Here's your precinct. Here's where you can go to vote. And it includes the opt-out information on the bottom. So if you choose not to exercise your right to vote, you have absolutely every right to do so. And if for some reason you miss that notification, let's say you forgot it, you didn't see it, the dog ate it, the, the kids threw it around the room, who cares? Whatever the, 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 the situation may be, there is still a remedy for those folks who do not want to be on a voter roll, who do not want to exercise their right to vote to do so. So there isn't any savings here. We're sending out the card one way or the other. And by the way, if you are not deemed to be an eligible voter, you will also get a nifty card in the mail that reminds you that you are not an eligible voter. And oh, by the way, in case you weren't already aware, it is a felony to vote when you are not an eligible voter. So all of these things come to pass. And while I appreciate that there may be some people who do not want to exercise their civic duty or their right to vote, it is hard for me to fathom any American citizen, any red-blooded American citizen who believes in freedom, who believes in the right to one vote, one voice, that would not want to go to the polls. While you absolutely have the, re the power to refuse, being registered does not mean that you will be voting. It just means that you have the right as an American citizen to make your voice heard. That is absolutely what we should be doing. It is your constitutional right to do so, and we absolutely should not be forbidding people from being registered to vote if they are eligible American citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I'm sorry you're misunderstanding uh, the situation in an extreme way in that this is not preventing somebody from registering to vote. If you read the language, this is, if I'm doing one of these multiple application uh, processes that I am opting not to be run through the automatic registration system, which is the, you know, I, I don't know where you get this, it's preventing somebody. No, this is only for someone that doesn't want to when they're re registering or applying for MA and all these other things. The next thing is you're saying there's no savings because we already send out the voter you know, registration. You know, we, hey, you're, you're registered. Again, you know, I don't know how to make it more clear and simple. This is where you're not wanting to be auto-registered. So they would not be sending out a card anyway because you're not registering. What this actually does save is sending out something to tell you, oh, you can opt out. When for decades, before the turn of the century, it was common when I would go online and do something, it would have the little pop-up, you, you can opt out of this or that. It's real simple. Uh, I'm sure high school students probably could code it. I mean, it's not a complex, heavy thing. And if we're implementing new stuff and we're updating, as the author says, the systems to get us more up to date, then we at least include things that are available so broadly, it's embarrassing that we can't do that. And if you talk to a lot of younger people, um, you know, mailing stuff, you know, they do it with their phones, um, you, you know? And so nothing wrong with the postal service and the mail, but, you know, you also, maybe save a few trees by not printing a bunch of stuff and mailing it out when you've got it right there. And if I go to the DMV, um, they already have the thing, do you want to check the box to be a, you know, organ donor and, and these little things? It's real easy to add it into the existing process 
It's not complex. And, you know, frankly, I'm shocked that we even don't consider making things convenient and implementing uh, modern or, you know, turn of the century modern conveniences for our citizens. Thank you. A roll was requested on the A6 amendment. Uh, the, seeing no further members' discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Freiberg. No. Vice Chair Greenman. No. Minority Lead Torkelson. Aye. Representative Agbaje. No. Representative Altendorf. Yes. Representative Bonner. No. Representative Bliss. Yes. Representative Coulter. No. Representative Davis. Yes. Representative Frederick. No. Representative Purcell? No. Representative Quam? Aye. Representative Stevenson is excused. Uh, there are five ayes and seven nays, so the amendment is not adopted. Uh, we are done with amendments, uh, so we can turn to member discussion of the bill as amended. Okay, seeing none. <laughs> Just uh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Repres uh, Representative Torkelson, would you like to go first, or do you have other members who wish to talk? I don't know. Um, I, did you have some questions? Um, yeah, I have oh, Representative Altendorf. I, I have some questions. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, so going back to the 2022 election, um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit confused by some different things in this bill, but um, are you aware of the spending and the percentage of what the Democrats spent versus the Republicans spent? Uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, uh, Representative Alton Um I think I have seen that. I think that the reality is that Democrats, Republicans, and independent expenditures spent an incredible amount of money in 2022. Okay. Representative Altendorf. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, the reason why I ask is, you know, we had some testifiers and they said, you know, people don't like the negative campaigning. They don't like what's happening. And I agree with that. We hear that all the time. But I, I don't see how this bill is going to address that or change that. Um, we're maybe just making things more complicated. And could you address that? Like, how in the world... Um, especially when it's pretty factual, the Democrats outspent the Republicans significantly here in the state of Minnesota, and yet it seems like the narrative is somehow flip-flopped. Um, the negative campaigning was coming from one side very, very strongly. So how is this correcting what some of your testifiers said that this is all of a sudden going to change the narrative in Minnesota? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Ald Aldenorf. I agree this is a bipartisan, multipartisan problem. And you won't hear me say that Democrats and Republicans aren't both. And, and frankly, and when we're talking about, you know, I, I think we use Democrats and Republicans broadly. What we're talking about here is the increase of outside spending. And sometimes, I mean, we can label it based on what folks are saying, but we don't actually know. If it's, it, it's not the parties, the parties have to disclose, it's the independent expenditures. And so I agree, I think I agree with our testifiers, I think you and I may agree, and I think we're, where we hear voters, I don't know if you heard it on the doors, but the, just the, the amount of money and the amount of negative energy and advertising. Um, frankly, the, the Supreme Court and Citizens United really limited the tools that we have uh, to deal with this outside spending. But one of the things we know is um, um, on the hard side, on the candidate side, you have, to put your, you have to put your name on it. You have to know who's spending it. On the independent side, we don't. And in lots of cases, and as you heard uh, um, Campaign Finance Board Chair uh, uh, Jeff Segrinson said, you know, we have a much nar more narrow strike zone of dis disclosure than even the federal government. So mm -hmm. when we think about uh, the folks spending money on state elections, they actually have to disclose less than they do if they're spending um, uh, uh, in, in the congressional elections. And so um, I would love to see a more robust way to prevent that, um, that negative advertising. Currently, the tools that we have uh, um, constitutionally are disclosure. And what this does, and I think the way that this, this will be helpful, is actually voters need to know who is spending money to try to influence their vote. And if voters don't like negative elections, 
they should know who is spending uh, uh, that money. And, and I think it's a nonpartisan issue. I think voters uh, um, are not making the distinguishing between more Democrats or more Republicans or more business groups or more uh, 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 um, liberal groups. Whatever you say, I think that uh, the reality is, is folks want to know who's trying to influence their elections and they want to know where that's coming from. And I think that that will help uh, um, reduce and, and bring down that temperature. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, if I may continue. Um, I also want to address the 16-year-olds. So as we all know, 16-year-olds, um, we cannot, they cannot, you know, uh, sign into a legal document, into a legal agreement. And um, in a time where I'm guessing every person in this room, right, we want fair, transparent elections. You know, we are tired of the back and forth and that type of thing. So why in a time like this, when there's already a lot of um, worry, rightfully so, about our elections, and why, why would we loosen the parameters to the point that more people are going to be questioning? Because the process, right, when we, when we, when we, when we loosen everything up, and now we're allowing 16-year-olds to pre-register, um, that's only drawing in more doubt, more questioning, because there's so many different people at different levels that are now a part of the election process when it should be very narrowed down and very, um, you know, held securely, right? We want fair, transparent, secure elections. What I see happening with this bill is we are blowing this apart and we are losing that security. Um, in California, they did something similar with this um, pre-registering to vote and they had thousands and thousands of people wrongfully registered. So we've already seen this in California. I know in Minnesota we like to walk down the line of being California, but we've already seen this. So I guess I would ask for us to really evaluate this. Why are we opening this up for more questioning, um, more scrutiny, people not feeling like this is secure, and we are opening this up to 16-year-olds who, again, cannot enter into a legal agreement, and now we're pre-registering them to vote? Uh, any comment briefly, Representative Greenman? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and you know, it allows me to say we'd also be walking down the path of Louisiana, Utah, Florida, North Carolina, and 15 other states uh, that already allow uh, um, um, uh, folks to, to pre-register. And here in Minnesota, we already have 17-year-olds who can pre-register if you're eligible by the election. You're on a pending list. Um, so I don't see the problem, and I don't actually think it's opening up. It's just allowing a bright line of if you're 16, you can get on that pending list. You won't be registered to vote until you're 18, just like current law. And one last one. Sure. Final one last one. Thank you so much. Um, and then I just would like you, uh, Representative, to please address um, the MCCL uh, saying that this is unconstitutional. Uh, I, I am very worried for the state of Minnesota, what's happening here um, within this, the, all of the government proceeding. Um, we have North Dakota that's suing us over the energy bill. Um, now we're hearing that this is unconstitutional. This law that's being pushed forth that's opening us up to more lawsuits. I know we just approved on the floor to give the AG uh, four million more dollars for his office, but I don't think Minnesotans want our money going towards these lawsuits that we are passing laws that are truly unconstitutional. Uh, comment, Representative. Uh, Raymond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the express advocacy provision in this bill is the current and constitutional federal standard um, that's being used in our federal elections. I heard Eighth Circuit dicta um, cited. Dicta, for folks who are not lawyers, is not binding precedent. Um, but what I do know is that this is the federal standard that currently all of our federal elections are run under. And that's all this does is adopt that federal standard. So um, there is not a constitutional problem. Um, and we haven't seen that at the federal level. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Representative Coulter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I want to Thank you, Representative Greenman, for, for doing the work and, and bringing this bill forward. And I guess to sort of start off with, we've heard even today and we've heard in other committee meetings that, that there is widespread lack of confidence in our elections, that folks are concerned. And I don't doubt that there are some folks who are concerned. But the last poll that I found showed 83% of Minnesotans have confidence in our elections. So, I mean, 83% is not 100%. But I think we just need to be very careful with our language when we speak as though something is universal when it is clearly not. Um, 
So, you know, I've, I've been sort of reflecting on this bill, and um, to me, I think it comes back to ultimately what is the goal of our elections? And the goal of our elections is to reflect the will of voters. And I'm not going to go into the full history, but we know that that list of who are voters has not been static over, our, over the history of our country. We've expanded it multiple times. And, but I think it comes back to reflecting the will of the voters. And the more that we can do to encourage, incent, remove barriers to ensure that everybody who can be a voter is, the more reflective our, our elections, excuse me, will be of our state and our communities. And I would think, as elected officials, that would be a goal we would all want to achieve. We want to know that the folks who send us here to do this work are reflective of the communities that we represent. And one of, I, I think to me that's the biggest reason to support this bill, is it removes some barriers in the process that I, I think may not be hugely significant, but nonetheless matter to a lot of folks. We heard about the hiccups uh, that sometimes occur with same day registration, and um, those of us who have served in local government have heard from our, our local elections officials about that. But I think it also addresses uh, what I would call sort of some of the less, bar less, less obvious barriers. And these are not so much about the process, but about the politics, the things that turn people off. And a lot of that comes from the spending, comes from the money. And, you know, I agree, it is, it is a nonpartisan, it's a bipartisan issue that it just takes too much money to run campaigns these days. Even those of us in relatively safe districts practically have to raise more than the average Minnesotan makes in a year just to get elected. And it's obscene. And the folks I talk to at the doors agree. And as Representative Greenman has said, Citizens United limits pretty well what we can do. Uh, but this is one, this is one way we can, we can hope to address that. And so I think there's a lot of good stuff in here, a lot of things that will strengthen our democracy and will help us, as, as Benjamin Franklin said, keep it. So I'm glad to support this bill. Thank you again. Thank you, Representative Coulter. Representative Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, sorry, I'm a little bit more direct this morning. Uh, the uh, uh, law enforcement was very active with sirens throughout the night and uh, I didn't get as much sleep, so I apologize for being, being direct. The, the last comment about too much money, uh, I, I routinely uh, get outspent by my opponent by five, ten times. Um, I found that, at least in my district, it's talking to the people is more effective than what's blabbing on the radio or TV or the news. Um, but I am, I, I guess I'm concerned that, uh, you know, the author stated 48 states are doing this, so we should add, we should be included. Hey, that's, that's good. Two, you know, we're one of two, two states not doing something. But we're one of three states that are not HAVA compliant. And that is disappointing that we aren't including HAVA compliance in this. And uh, well, that'll probably be, hopefully, another bill coming. Um, the concern about free speech, uh, we recently, as a state, lost a US Supreme Court case about free speech, free expression. And I think we should learn um, from that. And you know, even though we not, might not like what's being said, but if there is a nonprofit out there that's advocating on this issue, they're trying to help people. We might not agree with what their solution is, but we should not be making it harder for them to come together and speak out on issues. Uh, I, free speech is important. I'm sure we'll get some uh, comments related to that, I guess. But when we look at the automatic registration and there is the application for benefits or services to another participating agency, uh, the president recently extended the uh, pandemic emergency, which prevented um, 
the normal process of analyzing for qualification, et cetera. So there is going to be a huge uh, bump of activity probably in a few months. I don't know if he's going to extend the uh, pandemic emergency longer, but there will be, just for MA, there's over a million um, cases and applications or people on it that uh, have to be redone. Um, and if we're adding and changing this, uh, it, it's going to be a, a difficult time for a lot of agencies that are doing you know, the, the benefits, the services, and maybe implementing or rolling this out after just because one thing, we might find some glitches with the uh, DMV and some of the other stuff and we can have it better. And then when we roll it out to the other agencies, it'll be after that big bubble of activity where they're overwhelmed and there's more likelihood there could be some uh, you know, inadvertent clerical or data errors. Um, I think that would be a better approach. I'd like to see that uh, tweaked in the bill. Um, but I, I enjoy the intense attitude of trying to improve I wish there would be more inclusion of a broader perspective than we used to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Quam. Just so members are aware, you know, we have gone late the last couple of weeks. However, we have session today at 1010, so that won't be a possibility, so we will need to be voting by before 10 o'clock. Uh, Representative Igbadje. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief in my comments. I just want to say thank you, Representative Greenman, for bringing forward this bill. I know we also had discussions about this last term. Um, I just want to highlight two sections really quickly that I think are really strong and continuing to make sure that our democracy is really inclusive of people who live in Minnesota and who are eligible to vote. Um, the translation services, I think that that's a really strong aspect of this bill, making sure that the information is clear to people in the language that they know best. Yes, as the Secretary of State said, you do have to be proficient in English in order to become a citizen. But when you are reading technical information, when you just want to make sure you have a full understanding of what's in front of you so you can make that informed decision, I think being able to have those languages is, is a wonderful opportunity for more people to have access to the ballot box. Um, I do have one question in there, but, and I'll get back to it in a second. But, the second piece I wanted to lift up was also the space about limiting the ability for people to intimidate and interfere with the voting processes. Um, you know, we're continuing to live in an environment where more people feel more comfortable getting in each other's spaces, but I think when it comes to voting, you know, this should continue to still be a sacred space where you can make a decision on your own, informed. Um, and I, I appreciate bringing that up to ensure that people are free from intimidation when they're voting, because we do know that this country has a long history of intimidating uh, people who other folks may not have wanted to see vote from participating, and so I'm glad that we have this in there. The question I did want to ask, though, is we do have specifically uh, named three languages, Spanish, Hmong, and Somali, but we know that demographics can change over time. So are there plans in place to either update that in the future or is there the ability to change those languages should our demographics in Minnesota change requiring different languages? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Bajay for the question. Um, yes, I think that um, and in conversations with both the Secretary of State and thinking about how we apply this, we want to make sure that the languages um, that are represented are the ones that are being spoken. And if you look at the, um, uh, the, the way that we worked with the state demographer in the actual narrowing down to the precinct level, um, uh, making sure that you know, we know that in some places it may be Spanish or Somali, but it may also be Vietnamese um, or Korean. And so um, that is the intent of the bill, and it is the intent to try to use the data that we have to, to tailor it so that um, if there's high precincts with high language, um, uh, concentrations that we are accurately reflecting that. Thank right. you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Thank you. Representative Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Greenman, for bringing this forward. Um, I just want to say thank you for, for this. There's so many great things about this bill. Um, 
The pre-registration requirement, we've talked a lot about civics education in high school, getting folks engaged early. Um, certainly putting you on the list does not mean you are necessarily going to be registered to vote until you turn age 18, but getting folks in the practice of getting ready to engage in their civic duty is a really incredibly patriotic and wonderful thing to do. I think when we talk about voter registration, you know, if you like the idea of having better roles, more consistency, more checks and balances, automatic voter registration has been practiced in states across the country in red, blue, and purple. And there's a reason for that, because it does provide those additional checks and balances to make sure that the folks on our voter rolls are who they say they are, they live where they say they live, and they are an eligible voter. And that means that every voter gets to have a voice. That is key. Permanent absentee is about folks like our military, our elderly, our disabled, folks who want to be able to participate in our democracy, whose minds are sharp and alert, and they want to be a part of it. They want to be an American. They want to exercise that right. And so having the ability to do that not only cuts down on administrative issues and cost and makes it easier for election judges, but it makes sure that everyone has the ability to participate. That's what this grand American experiment is all about. And finally, when it comes to things like transparency, it is so important. We've talked a lot about money today, and it is grossly obscene, the amount of money that we spend on elections. I find people at the door saying to me, I want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from all these other groups with all the nonsense back and forth that I'm going to throw in my recycling bin. And I've had people ask me, how many people could we feed? How many people could we clothe? How many ills of society could we solve with even a small portion of the money we spend that ends up in a recycle bin? Instead of hearing from the actual candidates who are going to represent you, a my voice is being drowned out by nonsense. And voters want to hear from me. They want to hear from each of us. That's the key part. So we have to fix this. Voters are begging us to fix it. And finally, just to close out, or the United States of America is considered to be a beacon in the nation around democracy. And I remember back in college once, someone from Israel asked me, they said, why is not every citizen registered to vote when they are born in this country? You are the beacon. You are the example of democracy. Why do Americans put barriers in the path for citizens, legal US citizens, to vote and to be a participant in that democracy? And you know, I didn't have a good answer for her. Because she's right. We should be making sure that we are looking for every opportunity for every eligible voter, for every citizen to participate in this grand democratic experiment. And so for that reason, I am very enthusiastically voting yes on House File 3 today. Thank you, Representative Freeman, for bringing it forward. Thank you, Representative Bonner. I, I need to correct myself. I have been told we can go a couple minutes late. So um, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is an extensive bill. And I do have a series of questions. Um, I think it's probably going to run up against our time limit. Uh, and I think this bill deserves thorough examination, attention, and all questions answered. So I'm hoping that I don't get cut off, Mr. Chair. I'll do my best. We should uh, work here on an information basis, not necessarily by punching the time clock, Mr. Chair. First, um, I, I don't know if this, I assume the Secretary of State is not here, but I have some questions for the Secretary of State's office, if there's anyone here from the office. Is the Secretary of State's office able to come forward? Yes, uh, maybe ask your question while they're coming forward. Well, my question, uh, a couple of questions. One regarding same-day registration versus automatic voter registration. Um, I don't, you know, many of us are, some of us anyway are new to this committee, uh, quite a few of us, given the number of freshmen 
um, and I think we deserve to understand just what the differences are between what's required for a same-day registration versus what uh, is required for a, an automatic voter registration. Oh. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself and then respond to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Nicole Freeman, Office of Secretary of State, Government Relations Director. Uh, so same-day registrants um, have a variety of IDs that they can show um, and proof of residency that they can show. Um, it varies from uh, different uh, utility bills, um, IDs from other states, a military ID, a tribal ID, student IDs. Um, there's quite a long list. Um, I, can, I can get you the full list of, of all of them. Um, and at the uh, DMV, um, the, the folks through the automatic voter registration process that would be passed through to OSS that we would then pass to the counties, um, they would be showing a citizenship affirming documentation, uh, like a birth certificate, uh, a passport. Um, I'm sure there are other forms of ID that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head, but um, those are the, that's how the, the bill is currently written that if, they, if a uh, customer at, at the DMV shows uh, those types of documentation, um, they will be passed through. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. So once that uh, person who's uh, in the automatic water registration system uh, submits that information, it's then submitted and examined at the Secretary of State's office. Is that correct? Uh, Nicole Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so uh, uh, the data then comes to the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State's office compares it against um, lists of court data uh, for those under guardianship um, to remove those people um, since uh, those it would be uh, folks under guardianship who have had their right to vote revoked. Um, then the Secretary of State passes that data on to uh, the locals, um, to the counties to process as they do right now with DBS data. Thank you, Mr. Yep. Chair. Uh, Representative uh, Torkelson. So compare that then to what happens to the data that's, uh, that's involved with same-day registration. Uh, Nicole Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So uh, the, the process is, is quite similar. Um, so uh, when you register on election day, um, your information is, you're you know, physically showing the information, um, similar information to what you would be showing to get a driver's license. Um, uh, folks have said it before, it's, it's information that says you are who you say you are and you live where you say you live. Um, that information then is um, processed at the polling location and then is sent back to the counties um, for, for processing after election day. Um, the counties then do that data entry uh, and then it is loaded into the, um, loaded into the state voter registration system um, and, and then goes through the checks. Uh, through uh, DBS and um, postal verification card gets mailed out, things like that. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what about the citizenship verification piece? Is that the same in both cases? Uh, Nicole Freeman or Nicole? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Torkelson. So uh, um, the, the way that we... Um, the way that a voter uh, affirms their citizenship um, in Minnesota when you're registering is uh, through an attestation saying that you are a citizen, you are 18 years old. Um, that's what's on the, the current form um, is that checkbox and then the oath that folks are swearing to um, under penalty of perjury and um, voter fraud and uh, most likely other crimes. <laughs> Uh, Representative Torkelson. Thank you for that clarification. Just one more question for the Secretary of State's office regarding the languages. Secretary indicated earlier in his testimony that we have used languages in the past. Uh, does this always require legislative action to, to include or exclude languages as time marches on? Nicole Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I don't know off the top of my head uh, you know, historic all the way back to where the secretary was talking about um, what this legislation does, what this bill does is expands um, the, uh, expands and requires uh, materials to be available where, while um, currently it 
uh, is, you know, would be permitted to be available. Um, my understanding of the House File 3 is that it requires certain information to be available in, lang in various languages. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it sounds like the Secretary of State could do this on his own his, if he chose to. Quick, uh, Nicole Freeman, quickly. Sure. Uh, we do translate a number of materials into 11 languages, as the Secretary mentioned. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so Representative Torkelson. Mr. Chair, I have a series of questions for the bill authors. Sure. Uh, proceed. I don't know how much time we'll have, but uh, please begin. Uh, so uh, this question is regard Article 3 and the percentages uh, regarding foreign ownership of corporations. Uh, Representative Greenman, can you tell me where this language and these, rep these percentages came from? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative Tarkelson. I think we had a pretty extensive discussion on this when we heard the, the standalone bill. Um, and I don't, that, that was uh, uh, Representative Stevenson's bill. Um, and I think we actually had a, a video testimony sent around. I would have to get that uh, information for you. I think Ron Fine um, uh, 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 sent the video. Uh, but I just recently watched that, um, that hearing, and I know we had a, a conversation about it. So I'd have to get the citation for you. Um, but I believe we talked about it uh, a couple weeks ago. Representative Thank you, Torkelson. Mr. Chair. Perhaps could, Representative Stephenson, Stevenson has some idea where these percentages originated. Uh, Representative Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Torkelson, yeah, five, it's 5% five uh, threshold is uh, at the point at which uh, uh, it's been determined by a variety of metrics that uh, in, individual owners have an uh, uh, ability to influence decisions of the organization. And in fact, there are some SEC rules that come into effect at 5% uh, and some other, look at that, uh, some other uh, factors that go into trigger when you get to 5%. So that's where it comes from. Okay. Representative Thank Torkelson, you, I Mr. think Chair. the beeping signifies we are going to need to wrap up the questions shortly. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a series of questions. I understand. Um, we are going to need to leave fairly soon. Um, you can maybe have two, time for two more. Mr. Chair, I move to table the bill. Okay. Uh, motion. Roll call. And motion has been made to table the bill, and a roll call has been requested. That is not a debatable motion, so the clerk will take the roll. Chair Freiberg. No. Vice Chair Greenman. No. Uh, Minority Lee Torkelson. Aye. Representative Agbaje. No. Representative Altendorf. Aye. Representative Bonner. No. Representative Bliss. Yes. Representative Coulter. No. Representative Davis. Yes. Representative Frederick. No. Representative Purcell. No. Representative Quam. Aye, aye. Representative Stevenson. No. Okay, there being five ayes and eight nays, the motion does not prevail. Do, uh, do you have an, an additional question? I have a series of questions, Mr. Chair, and I would like to continue. Uh, you can uh, have time for one more, I think. Mr. Chair, I have more than one question. I understand. Uh, you know, we're just not doing our jobs. Uh, Representative Greenman, does Citizens United allow or prohibit corporate speech? Um, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and uh, uh, um, uh, Representative Tarkelson. Uh, Citi what Citizens United does is it says that corporations can spend independently in our elections. Representative Tarkelson, follow up. Final follow up. Uh, Representative, uh, does that include corporate speech, free speech? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think if what you're getting at, what Citizens United said, is that that spending and money it interprets as speech. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it didn't touch on disclosure um, and uh, the constitutional parameters around uh, foreign, uh, um, both foreign individuals and foreign entities spending in our elections is pretty clearly allowed to be prohibited. Representative. Uh, Torkelson, would you like to Greenman. request a roll call on the final passage of the bill? I just want to make sure that's on the record. Yeah, well, you have to have a roll call on the final passage of the bill. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's required. Uh, it's, it's actually, I believe it's only required when we have a virtual meeting. It's not. So um, All right. I'll, I'll make a motion a roll to roll request call. a roll Thank call. You, How about Chair. that? M Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, Representative Torkelson has the floor. Representative Greenman, does your bill restrict free speech as determined by the Supreme Court? in the Citizens United. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, and I think if you uh, read the, the readings from Robert, uh, Justice Scalia, who I did not like to say very often, um, he talks about disclosure as actually an aid to free speech because we then know who and folks can interpret um, who's spending and who's speaking. Uh, Representative Greenman, do you have any uh, brief wrap-up comments? Mr. Chair, I have other questions. 
uh, Representative uh, Greenman, would you like to wrap up? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I note that this bill will go through about six different committees and, and have appreciated the conversations of both sides of the aisle that I've had on this bill. It also had um, uh, um, about 10 hours of committee hearings uh, last year. Um, but I would just say that this bill um, is a uh, package of things that both red states and blue states have passed, um, and it is an um, important tool to uh, strengthen and protect our democracy. And thank I'd you. ask for your vote. With that, Representative Mr. Greenman Chair, can't we get a room for tonight? As amended, be Mr. Recommended Chair, to be can't you reserve a room for tonight so we can actually committee. finish discussions? Chair Freiberg. Yes. Vice Chair Greenman. Aye. Minority Lead Torkelson. Representative Ogba Ogbaje. Aye. Representative Altendorf. No. Representative Bonner. Aye. Representative Bliss. No. Representative Coulter. Aye. Representative Davis. No. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Purcell? Aye. Representative Quam? No. Representative Stevenson? Aye. Uh, there being eight ayes and five nays, the motion is uh, adopted. The bill is referred. Uh, with that, the committee is adjourned.